Good morning, everybody, and welcome. This is Lizzie and Justin at Turning Towards Life from Third Space, and we're delighted to be here yet again welcome on a Sunday Lizzie morning. And Justin. In sorry about that, my microphone just caught our recording. Um, Sunday live in July at the end of July, twenty twenty three. And we're really grateful that you're here, that we're here, that we get to do this each week. And as usual, Justin's brought an extraordinary source that has had me wondering and discombobulating since I read it. And I'm really grateful, Justin, for your range of sourceness as well. And actually this week, Justin, I didn't tell you, but somebody who's a listener here reposted Nahiro, um, where you're in Nahid's poem from last week in their Instagram and did a whole thing on it. And I just feel like these little things happen and people's work spreads because of what we're doing. And I feel really grateful for that. So I just want to say, if you want to send out whatever the source is in a different way to the world, like, like this lady did, please do. It's such a wonderful way that people's work reaches further, that we do it here and or we talk about it here and then it somehow gets into everybody's hearts and minds and then spreads further in the world so I feel like that's another purpose of turning towards life that I never thought about before that actually it's a really wonderful platform for people's creativity and expression reaching further so there's another layer of gratitude I have for this that that's what happens from it as well so thank you Justin for always choosing those sources and and for me too that kind of want to travel as it were yeah, it's a very special privilege, isn't it, Lizzie, to find good work and to make it available to people. Yeah. I feel uh, very, very lucky to be doing that. And for any of you who are with us, welcome. Welcome. You can always uh, get this week's source in the notes to the podcasts. If you follow us on YouTube, it's always in the, the notes for the YouTube. Um, but there's also an email. If you come to our website, turningtowards.life, right on the front, you can sign up for a weekly email that will send the source and information about it and the this conversation um, directly into your email inbox, which some people like. And you can find there all 300 and two previous sources which is another way Lizzie of making this vast body of work not just our work in this but everyone else's creativity that we've been um has been feeding into this over the years is all available there can I say as well Justin every time that email gets sent out you write the most beautiful summary of what the conversation covered and when I receive the email I always think just reading that bit is really worth having the emails even if I wouldn't click through to the actual audio or the video your summaries are so beautiful that you do of what we talked about so just to say that's another little bonus that even if you're at work and you receive it it's not like you all there is is a video and all there is is an audio there's a little summary of the conversation which is really beautiful so it's fun writing those Lizzie because I, I usually do them straight after we've spoken and then part of the work is feeling into what it was like to be in the conversation seeing what I can remember I, I, I always aware that it's a very partial description but it is a it is a, it is a path though. into what mm. we've been up to yeah so this week it's my mm. week to choose a source and um we are bringing here uh, Oliver Berkman's work I think this is the maybe the third or fourth time that Oliver's writing has shown up in the in the podcast Lizzie and um uh, because because we work so hard to try and have a, a range of sources, it's so interesting when I when I pick someone for the third or fourth time, I always go, "Oh, is that too much?" And then I think, "No, no, there are three hundred other episodes. It's <laughs> it's fine." And yeah. I love, I, I want to really appreciate um, Oliver. I don't know if you'll ever get to listen to this, but you and your work. I've been um, following Oliver's work ever since he started writing in a, a British uh, newspaper, and the way I understand it. Uh, Lizzie's he started off um sort of writing a critique of many books that fall into what might loosely be called the self-help category of things and along the way of course um the way I saw it is he found of course a lot of books that were not greatly helpful but many that were deeply 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 helpful and for a long time he's been writing with enormous depth and clarity about some of the big questions about being a a person that came from all this reading he must have read hundreds and hundreds of these mm. books 
for this to happen. So you can always find Oliver. He has a website and a blog uh, and has written some very good books, <clears throat> a couple of which we've quoted from. And this is actually from his uh, from Oliver's blog. <clears throat> and it's called, <coughs> excuse me, The Awkwardness Principle. And it begins with a quote from Bruce Tift. The practices that carry the greatest potential for transformative change are usually counter instinctual. If you're trying to get better at life in some way, more patient or better at listening or less prone to procrastination or anxiety or self-sabotage, the necessary actions are pretty much guaranteed not to feel especially good. They're more likely to feel scary or at least awkward, like wearing an ill-fitting shirt or writing with your non-dominant hand. While learning to be patient, you should expect to feel restless. As you embark on a long postponed creative project, you should expect to feel unready. One way or another, change will feel crappy. This shouldn't really come as a surprise. After all, you're attempting in some way to be different than you are. That's true, by the way, even if your goal is to become more accepting of how things are. Yet your entire personality up to this moment has been one long exercise in getting good at being who you currently are. So, of course, you'll feel ungainly and self-conscious when you try to do otherwise. Most of us grow up with a deep-seated belief that there are certain feelings we can't allow ourselves to feel. Maybe you were raised with the message that you shouldn't depend too much on others or that you shouldn't stand out from the crowd or that you should stand out from the crowd or that you always have to have a clear plan for the future or that people are out to take advantage of you. For a small child, falling in with these family patterns feels like a matter of survival. So by the time you're an adult, you're deeply convinced that easing up on them that is, by allowing yourself to depend on others or to stand out or to operate without a clear plan, etc., would be to invite disaster. No wonder the prospect seems utterly terrifying. Thanks, Justin. The practices that carry the greatest potential for transformative change are usually counter instinctual. That's a quote from Bruce Tift. And then Oliver says, if you're trying to get better at life in some way, more patient or better at listening, or less prone to procrastination or anxiety or self-sabotage, the necessary actions are pretty much guaranteed not to feel especially good. They're more likely to feel scary or at least awkward, like wearing an ill-fitting shirt or writing with your non-dominant hand. While learning to be patient, you should expect to feel restless. As you embark on a long postponed creative project, you should expect to feel unready. One way or another, change will feel crappy. This shouldn't really come as a surprise. After all, you're attempting in some way to be different than you are. That's true, by the way, even if your goal is to become more accepting of how things are. Yet your entire personality up to this moment has been one long exercise in getting good at being who you currently are. So of course you'll feel ungainly and, un and self-conscious when you try to do otherwise. Most of us grow up with a deep-seated belief that there are certain feelings we can't allow ourselves to feel. Maybe you were raised with the message that you shouldn't depend too much on others or that you shouldn't stand out from the crowd or that you should, that you should stand out from the crowd or that you should always have a clear plan for the future or that people are out to take advantage of you. For a small child, falling in with these family patterns feels like a matter of survival. So by the time you're an adult, you're deeply convinced that easing up on them, that is by allowing yourself to depend on others or stand out or operate without a clear plan, etc., would be to invite disaster. No wonder the prospect seems utterly terrifying. As you were reading, Lizzie, I was wondering in my own mind, about examples of this for myself because there are so many of these and the the thing that um where I wanted to find my way into it is right in this place that Oliver writes about about the things 
There's, he he writes about the prospect seeming utterly terrifying, and that feels true, and has felt true to me for a lot of things. But there's another part of it that he doesn't exactly say, which is where the the thing that would become possible doesn't even occur to us as a possibility. It doesn't even show up to me as something I might even consider, even if I'm trying to become more patient. Or... So I noticed when you were talking that there's a part of me that is really, 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 really used to planning for the future and finds it very, very difficult to let go of that. And doesn't really want to let go of it and that part of me was planning very very hard what example I might bring to this very conversation when you'd finished speaking and um fortunately there are many many other parts of me that I've come to know apart from this part that is absolutely desperate to have a hold on what's going to happen how it's going to happen and what my part of it in it is and that I would stay safe and look good and be competent and all of those things in the middle of it so I'm glad that that's not all of me um, but boy, is that part convinced that the world can only be a safe place if I'm ahead of the game. And it gets really frightened. Which is one of the reasons why this practice of us talking with one another in the way that we have has been such a good um, counter practice to it. Because I agree with Oliver that stepping into the the thing that's outside our view can feel awful and i think it's why practice really helps mm. and i think it's why practice being with other people really help like this part of me that can't imagine a world which is completely spontaneous and has lots of good reasons and i think about this part where oliver says you know in our early life one way or another we take on various the messages about it this this part of me decided from the evidence early on that being spontaneous and any kind of wildness and any kind of un unknownness was definitely risky and worked very hard to shape me so i wouldn't i would never enter into that um that part of me gets to settle and meet something else through what we're doing through being with you through feeling very safe with you, and then through hundreds of weeks of uh, putting out into the world, uh, I know that lots of other people listen to this conversation. So, so it's quite a big thing for this part of me to learn that the very thing that it took to be so terrifying that it had good reason to feel terrified about, uh, that that's not the only way to feel about it. So I'm feeling grateful this morning for practice, and it's it's the part, uh, there's a lot more that Oliver wrote about this, but it's the part that's not reflected here, is what do we do? What might we do when we find the, the edge, the very thing we want to walk into that we th think maybe ought to be easy or joyful and turns out to be really hard and really frightening? How do we respond to it? One way we respond to it is to find others who we trust, who can receive us whilst we walk the wobbly path of being on the outside of what's been familiar. Mm. My goodness, just listening to you, Justin. I feel like, oh, how do I say how I feel? There's like an eruption of all these different thoughts and wonderings and directions and this feels like a very powerful wondering that we're in about practice so I'm gonna have to do a thing of picking a thread that feels like the thread that wants to be picked and okay so one of the threads is about practice and how the cool thing for me about a good practice, one that's solid and kind of worthy of my awkwardness, <laughs> is that it doesn't just change one thing in my life 
changes like lots and lots of things. So for example, this practice of doing basically the same thing every week, but what, what emerges is different content, but the, the time is the same, the humans involved is the same, the technology is the same, the day is the same, the structure is the same. There's lots of sameness about it. And then there's a content that's different, but then there's the, then there's the consequences of it. Well, there's the consequences of thing, other people being impacted by the conversations we have and the inquiries that are, get invited in us and everyone else in the community that's listening. But then there's, then there's my consequences. So what I can see from this practice is that it's changed many things in my life because I do this, which I could never have foreseen. So I feel able to articulate myself and take time to say the thing that feels most meaning to say. And that translates into a meeting or a conversation with a neighbor or a difficult conversation in some work setting. There's a there's a something that's getting a confidence, I think, or a faithfulness or a trust or a courage that's got born in me because we do this. That each week we've stood on the edge of nothingness with a kind of little branch of a source, which isn't just a little branch, it's a big branch, but it but there's a lot of space around it where you could fall off and goodness knows in that narrative of planning that you were talking about. And so doing that again and again, not only just keeps me able to stay here and do this with you each week, but it translates into all these other areas of my life. And so I, I can see the, I don't know what the word is, the, the capacity or the skill, or I don't know if skill sounds terrible, doesn't it? Like um, the, maybe the habitual, ease of speaking without knowing what I'm going to say becoming more and more natural or something like that and then of course that translates everywhere and so in my mind that makes it very worth doing it's worth doing for lots of reasons but for that reason of practice of watching how the how the the impact of this impacts the rest of my life and one other consequence Justin for me is I was talking about this with somebody on Friday, I think it was, when we were speaking about what it's like to talk to another person for whom these inquiries are very unusual and how somehow for me this practice, I'm just making this link now, has enabled me to do that without ever wanting to convince anything of any any anyone of anything and I don't quite know how that's all connected but there's something about the way that we get to express ourselves here that I don't need other people to listen to me in a in a kind of social setting it's like this this practice of, of really expressing myself genuinely with no defensiveness involved with no barriers to my expression satisfies me in a way that I don't need people to listen to me because I get listened to here so there's also like a way that these practices this practice in particular leaves me with a lot more acceptance about the world the world not changing at the pace that I want it to change or the world not being the world I want it to be because there's such a full expression of me here that that need is being really profoundly met and I know I'm being heard. And so then I don't really have that desperate need for someone to understand me or see me or hear me in other places so much anymore. So I'm just feeling really curious about the kind of offshoots of practice, even if that's not what you set out. That's not what I set out to do this for. I didn't come in here thinking, oh, I'd really like it not to have to sit next to somebody at a wedding and then not have to tell them what I do and for them to traditionally get really 
irritated with me or defensive with me and say, oh, you're a navel gazer or you're, a, you know, all those things that come, they've come at me in my life anyway. If, if I speak about what's meaningful to me, like topics like this, many of the people in the world just, it's not what they're up to or whatever. And so I'm feeling really grateful for that as well, because I just don't feel like that anymore. And I put it largely down to, to this feeling of expressing myself, being listened to, being heard and having a voice in the world. So I don't have to have a voice at the dinner table so much, if that makes sense. There's, um, I can't remember if what I'm about to say comes from somewhere else in this piece that Oliver wrote, if it was someone from someone completely different uh, escapes me. You know, this, this part at the beginning where Bruce Tift says, who's a psychotherapist, that the practices that carry the greatest potential for transformative change are usually counter instinctual. So there's this point at which whoever it was who was writing says, one of the questions you can ask yourself when you're, when we, when we settle in this place of wanting to unfold something in ourselves that hasn't had a place in the world yet take up a new way that's more in line with what we care about for example like what you're talking about Lizzie about being able to speak in a particular way undefended the one of the one of the best questions we can ask ourselves is what is the last thing that I would normally do in order to bring this about and then do that of course there are caveats around that you know the last thing might be something that's uh, physically <laughs> risky or hurtful to others you know not that but to, to feel that there's a sort of instinctual space that we've made that's not the only space and that it's been made by, as Oliver says, big part of how it's made is what we made of our experiences of growing up in a culture and a family or caregiving system, whatever it is. We internalized all of those and had to make some sense of it and we build the boundaries of the world. So the one part of it is taking up a practice um, like asking, like receiving help or stepping up to lead or being patient or um find the thing that would be the the least likely thing for you to do and then start practicing that right in the awkward point that makes the world bigger so that's all my mind and then what what you're saying is or what i heard in what you're saying is not just what the practice can make but also the role of other people in it because this is the part that oliver doesn't talk about here which is when i start doing something that is very counter instinctual to me it's quite likely that the people who i'm used to having around me are people who somehow dovetail with or slot in with my habitual very very familiar ways of being now I may not like it that it is that way but it often is that way so when we start um, speaking up about something or explaining something in a new way or not jumping in when people are used to jumping us jumping in as well as all of the inner stuff in us, there's also all the inner stuff that's going on in all the other people about what a, a, a threat it is to their familiar way of knowing us and familiar way of being the world. And I and I really know this in the territory, for example, of talking about what I know shared commitments and shared values that have brought us into friendship and into working together, Lizzie, in the way that we do. Um, very often when I articulate those, I feel all of that going on in me at the same time. There's all the places in me that feel awkward when it's outside, and there's all the reactions of all the other people around. So I don't think that any of us can can easily do this on our own when that's it is possible to to bring about that kind of um learning and unfolding in us on our own to a certain extent. But so practicing with other people as a kind of rehearsal is also very helpful like there's a way in which you could say that this conversation is is a practice it's it's a thing we're doing for its own sake then we can bring the the lens of practice to it oh we're doing it to actively cultivate something to learn how to do something better and better and better and to um you know to bring our skillfulness and our courage and our love and our capacity to it and then there's a way in which it's also a rehearsal so i get to rehearse talking to you who i know will welcome me and respond truthfully and um and then that builds in me capacity to speak more in line with what i value right in those circumstances that you were saying are the difficult ones and i really think that's that's true and i've been watching myself in this um 
space of leadership in a community that I'm involved in at the moment where um, I have previously been very used in that community to being understood, to being, um, to having people take what I say, to agree with what I say and what I brought and to be competent to what I'm doing. And I'm in a space of leadership, different space of leadership in this moment in the community where I'm often not understood or don't understand others, where there's lots of disagreement about the things I say, or I disagree with other people, or um, I feel deeply, deeply incompetent, which is the thing that's right on the outside of my familiar, is to is to really feel like I don't know what I'm doing, and then not run from it, or not freeze, or not, and to start to see that to do this role, I cannot know what I'm doing. So practicing with you here gives me a chance to practice articulating who knows what's going to come and be welcome and for it to be public. And then practicing there right in the difficult spot with people who I, I care about, but I'm, I'm also way on the edge of my way in this uh, counter instinctual, terrifying zone. I'm very, very glad that I have people around me who understand this dynamic i think this is the place i'm getting to who don't just go we'll run away because that's your ordinary thing mm. and then places i can rehearse mm. and then places i can go right out on the high high wire oh, it's not really a high wire mm. right it's just talking to people but it feels like a high wire in me yeah so interesting justin hearing you of, of course there's loads of eruptions but the big one is I feel really excited when I imagine you being incompetent. <laughs> like, oh, that's going to be cool. Let's, let's, I want to be there when you're being incompetent because it's also very much not my experience because you're an extremely competent person in my world. And so when I think of you being incompetent, I'm like, oh, that's interesting to me. And so I'm, I'm curious about the role of others in our development too, in this moment, just like you're saying. Because I could respond, you know, when, when a friend starts saying no, when they've already, always said yes to me, I could be really annoyed with them. I'm like, sorry, you don't get to say no when I need you to take me somewhere in the car. You have to say yes, because I've, I've, I've planned on you saying yes to me because that's who you've been all these years. And then all of a sudden they start saying, no, I can't do that. That doesn't fit with my energy levels or my, what I want or whatever. And then I, I could be, I could be really annoyed about that. Or I could be curious. I could be surprised and I could say, oh, what's, what's happening? What are you, what are you up to not saying yes to me? Like you normally have done. What's going on? What are you learning? What are you discovering? And that feels really compelling. And I know the part of me that is like going to be annoyed that they're not being the way I want them to be because I've learned them that way. But then feel much more excited by the part that can go, what's happening here? What's going on? And then I start thinking about what it is to enroll people in the process so that they, that they know that it's kind of foreshadowed that something's going to be different. So if I say to you, I'm going to practice being reliant on people because I've got this narrative, well, this is real, that in, you know, in our community, Justin, you were just talking about this too. The thing that I've been learning over the years is that I have a very, very strong narrative of I should be able to do this on my own and I should be able to do it all. And then being in our little third space community, I've realised over and over and over again, and it's still, still lots to be undone in me, I've realised that we can, we can mould ourselves, we can shape ourselves, to the circumstances and bring the thing we can bring. And most of the time, the collection of us meets the need that's being presented, but that I don't have to be the one that, that can do everything or that should be able to do everything. 
or that should be strong enough all the time to hold whatever needs to be held and that I can relax into a system and not be the person that's perfect or has it all together all the time and still there's a there's a response in me which is the awkward territory for me of feeling guilty of where there's generosity around me of don't worry we can we can do that but you can just do that bit because that feels doable to you right now there's still this guilt that arises in me of oh my god but I should be able to do that I should be able to hold that thing or I should be able to be as organized as I need to be or whatever the thing is and that's the territory where I have to sit and I have to name it and I have to say I feel really awkward and guilty because I don't feel like I'm doing I'm being who I should be being but as soon as I recognize that as a narrative and I name what's happening I can label it actually this is language is really helpful to me that oh I'm in the awkwardness I'm in the the response to doing something differently and that that is it as I name it as being that it kind of stops that from being the powerful thing it might be that takes me away from carrying on doing the practice so I'm feeling grateful to be able to see that and to name it and there's and like you said at the beginning Justin there's so many of these things for me all the time and often if I don't begin practice them practicing them consciously they will be bestowed on me somehow <laughs> so if I don't practice reliance on others I know that so many times I've become against my will almost although I, I trust the bigger picture profoundly I know that that will be given to me unless I take it up myself when I can feel it calling to me so one way or another there's many many of these threads of uh, trying to be different than I am both because that's what the circumstance is demanding but also because of my conscious oh, I think this needs to be I think I need to be different somehow in terms of my behaviors how I'm interacting with people the language I'm using in service of the thing that's really important to me as we um, come towards the close Lizzie there's so much in what you just said that is striking me but I want to appreciate two of them because they seem central to this conversation so one is why do any of this at all why why not just pursue the path of feeling good that would be the alternative path to what Oliver writes about and in a world that's very difficult of course feeling good can be very welcome and why not accept that feeling good or feeling familiar or feeling comfortable in what we're in keeps us in very small bounds and you just talked about service and it seems to me that this is what enables us in the end to be of service to be of service to values that we hold important or to be of service primarily to others or to be of service to life itself if we're called upon to step out or to hold back or to become more compassionate or more patient or unfold our creativity into the world for the sake of ourselves and other people we're gonna have to um give up avoiding how difficult that feels to do mm. and then the second thing is i think you said the awkwardness zone or something like it and i feel like i want to make um a joyful a joyful celebration of anyone any of us who commit to taking up the practice and finding the kind of support in and around ourselves to hang out in the awkwardness zone mm. because so many of the troubles in the world big and the ones that are really close into us in our own lives actually really call on us to um venture into the awkwardness zone very frequently which is simply the zone of what's unfamiliar so far Mm. that's what it is so uh I feel like saying here's to here's to learning to be of of service to life itself and here's to hanging out in the awkwardness zone as 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 alongside everything else that's called for mm. 
all the other things that we need to do to take care of ourselves and life around us. And there can be enormous joy in that too. So um, I'm feeling celebration in celebration of the possibility and the not easiness of it mm. as we end. I want to say thank you to you, Lizzie, for always bringing yourself with courage and openness and such generosity this, to this conversation as part of the joy of and not knowing what on earth we're going to talk about is really not knowing what you're going to say. Because what you have to say is always a response to what's here. So thank you for being that one. And thank you everyone for being with us. And please remember that you're very welcome to share this source, to share this conversation, to share the emails or the podcast or something with someone else. If you know someone else who would benefit from this. I think there are very few things that would give us greater joy, Lizzie, um, than knowing that it got into the hands of people for whom it could be of uh, some support. Yeah. And um, all being well, we will be back again at the same time and in the same place next week. And we'd love to see you there. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone.